G'day folks, my name is Rob, welcome back to another F1 Fantasy video. Today we are looking at the top 5 mistakes you can make as an F1 Fantasy strategist in this game. So if you're new around here and you're enjoying the content, please do like the video and subscribe to the channel. So the first mistake you can make as a strategist playing F1 Fantasy is reacting adversely to how your team's performed in the most recent race week. It's very easy to get carried away when your team score doesn't stack up to your peers and you want to essentially make knee-jerk or rage transfers to offset the disappointment of a certain driver, perhaps not finishing the race or not scoring as well as you would have anticipated. I think as well, the most important thing that I tend to do is take a step back from my team a day or two after the race weekend has concluded, pick it up again on say the Wednesday or the Thursday or even in the next week if there's more than a week's break between races just so it gives me enough time to really think about whether or not the decision I want to make for a certain driver or constructor is the best one and also essentially wait until we've got practice, more information and data available to us to guide that decision-making process as well. There's no time-sensitive requirements to book transfers in ahead of time. So why wait or why why make that trade and wait until we look closer to the deadline to make that decision, particularly when there's more information, there's more content around each of the drivers and constructors to help you inform whether or not that's the best decision for your team for this weekend and the weekends following. I think as well, it's very easy for this to snowball when you've got, say, a couple of DNFs or poor performers in your team in the same race week and you're wanting to make multiple transfers to move them out in favor of informed drivers and constructors. Now, a minus four for the cost of the transfer at the moment is not very high in the grand scheme of 200 to 300 points per week that we would ordinarily score. But it's very easy to get carried away and perhaps end up using the wild card as one method of offsetting that that negative points attributed when you make those extra transfers. But realistically, I think limiting those unnecessary hits and planning out which drivers are going to suit your team and the upcoming circuit is probably the best approach at a very high level. I think there's absolutely that go more that goes into that decision-making process. But as, as long as you're not getting carried away making wholesale changes to your team every single race week, then I think that's the first step in making sure you're not you know, taking minus eights, minus twelves, or whatever the points penalty is for a trade in this upcoming season. Another mistake I see certainly very early on is strategists going differential just because they feel like they have to. The template is popular for a reason. And Red Bull, Aston Martin in the first half of last season, Red Bull, McLaren in the second half of last season were the popular picks and for good reason. They were the drivers and constructors that were in form, that were scoring the most points at their price points. And there's a reason so many strategists that are high up the ranks pick these drivers and constructors. I would say there's perhaps some reason to go differential for, say, a certain driver, but moving the DRS boost off Max Verstappen in favor of a Fernando Alonso is more often than not not going to pay off for you, as well as the fact that, you know, if you do want to move Perez out, I think, for instance, like he was poorly performing last season, is not necessarily the worst decision to make, but I think moving for someone like a Carlos Sainz or a George Russell or Orlando Norris instead of someone like Pierre Gasly or Esteban Ocon, which you would expect more often than not are not going to be in contention for podiums is probably not the best approach. So just think about when you do want to go differential, there is some element of thought put into it and you're not going differential just because you have to make up or you think you have to make up you know, 30, 50 points in one single race week. It's a long season and over the course of an entire season, it's very easy to claw back points when you use not just your chips effectively, but also think about the decision-making process and the types of drivers and constructors you want in your team each race week. Now, another mistake I see from a lot of strategists is blowing your chips very early. I would highly recommend avoiding using them early in the season, partly because of the fact sprint races are optimal times to use some of the more powerful chips. I wouldn't say that's the only time, but a good instance to consider using them. But also because I think a lot of people do want to get ahead in the ranks early on, and that's fair enough, but there's better ways of doing that than perhaps just using all five or six of your chips in the first six race weeks. You do see a lot of people early on get to the front of the field because they've used limitless extra DRS autopilot in the first three weeks but there are more optimal times to use them. And I think when you're strategically thinking about when you want to activate these chips at the more optimal race weeks, that's when you're going to build more points 
increase your ranks and move further up the field. So I think thinking about when you want to use them, and I guess that kind of jumps into my third point on the screen here, is having a plan as to when it's most effective to use them. I'll get to that in a minute. But another mistake that I can, I have made before and I've seen other strategists make too is a hoarding chips. Now, I think last season was an interesting year for the game. There were a lot of new chips. We weren't really quite sure how the point scoring would shake up and it got to the second half of the season. A lot of us had, you know, four, five, maybe even six chips still to use with only 12 races left on the calendar. So I would, as I said before, make a plan as when you want to use them, be flexible with when you want to use them, but don't end up in the last two races of the season like it happened to me where I had wildcard on autopilot. I'm glad they weren't powerful chips and the payoff using them then wasn't really necessarily that low or that high. But think about the optimal times to use them. The game is very fluid and things can change in an instant. An instance where using your chips at a, perhaps a, an opportune time but being flexible was in Monza last year. We saw a lot of people activate the limitless which I think is still very powerful to use on a sprint weekend, but that, that Monza weekend was where Mercedes and Ferrari both performed really well in practice. They ended up doing quite well across the entire weekend and drivers, sorry, strategists that moved for drivers in Ferrari and Mercedes were handsomely rewarded. That was itself a differential weekend to use that limitless chip because it wasn't a weekend. A lot of people had planned to use it, but it still ended up being a weekend that bore a lot of fruit for those people that were willing to take a risk and kudos to them that were able to successfully use that limitless chip then but to the contrary you don't also use chips on a random weekend just for a rush it's very easy to fall back early in the season but there's a lot of racing still to do and a lot of ground that can be easily made up with a couple of lucky or good weekends and what I've seen some people do in the past is you know, you go into a weekend, let's say Monaco, for example, where there's not going to be a lot of overtakes, there's not going to be a lot of points on the table, but you're sitting down in the millions, for instance, you're not sure where your season's going. So you decide to activate Limitless for that quick rush to try and claw back some ground. Sure, it might help that race weekend, but as soon as those sprint race weekends hit, the rest of the field, or at least the rest of those engaged strategists are going to search straight past you with twice as many points on offer in some cases. So Sure, I appreciate you do and you may feel as though you're a bit behind the eight ball, but being patient is very essential to making sure your chips are used effectively and your rank can continue to climb as the season moves forward. Another mistake a lot of people can make in this game is ignoring data. Data and information available to us is key in this game. It helps us drive our decision-making process every single race weekend. Practice sessions in particular are essential. The reason why I say that is because of the fact that each track is very different to the next one. Certain drivers, certain cars are suited to certain tracks. An example of that last season was Williams. They had excellent straight line speed. They did very well at circuits like Monza, um, certain parts of the Interlagos course last season, other, other street circuits like Baku, there were a lot of straights and the Williams was very effective. Alex Albon did very well on those weekends. And then you look at other cars like McLaren suited to higher downforce circuits like Qatar, for instance. Those are the weekends where you want to be able to swiftly pivot to different drivers, different cars based on how they're performing in practice because it gives us the best read of how those cars are likely to go that weekend. So make sure that you do give yourself time to watch at least one of the practice sessions. FP2 and FP3 are usually better and look at the simulation data for the qualifying and the race pace to also educate yourself on where you think certain cars are going to start on the grid or at least performing qualifying and how they may perform by the end of the race weekend. So I think using that data available to us is also super helpful when making those trades and informing us as to how we want to tackle that weekend. There's also so many interesting resources out there. F1 Fantasy Tools, F1 Fantasy HQ. I'll shout out a couple of those guys. I'll shout out myself on Twitter. I'm pumping out information on Twitter every single race weekend. So keep an eye for me and those guys and other content creators over on Twitter, for instance, and their mediums as to how they publish data and information because it certainly helps us when it gets to the next race weekend. 
So this next one is around limiting outside influence. Sounds a little bit ironic given I create content for F1 Fantasy, but I think being able to scale back the amount of content you perhaps consume is maybe a good thing, I would argue, to a certain extent. But before I get into that, there's also a number of other factors that are outside of our control. I think the first one is obviously qualifying results. It's very easy to get carried away with how our team might be looking, shaping up for the Grand Prix on Sunday after, a, say, for instance, a very bad qualifying. But by the same token, you, you don't want to be overly optimistic just because you might have a really good qualifying result. All five of your drivers are into Q3. You're looking good. It's very easy that a DNF can change your outcome of your weekend on a dime. And it doesn't necessarily mean that how your team's going on Saturday is going to translate to results on Sunday. So don't be overly optimistic. Don't be overly pessimistic. And that's one reason why I don't post my qualifying results on Twitter because it doesn't, yes, it's obviously great, but I don't think it paints a great picture as to how your team's going to look like by the end of the weekend. I'm all for people sharing their results and you know each one of us gassing each other up if we've had a great weekend. But qualifying for me doesn't really count for much until I see all of those drivers cross the line in one piece. So it's not something we can necessarily control qualifying or the race. So I think all we can do is once the deadline hits, as I said, with making those decisions, take a step back. This is out of our hands. Whatever happens, happens. And if there's results that are not what we expect or what we want, then we make those adjustments in the following week. But once those deadlines finish or they, they lock in, there's not much we can do then. Another thing I really stress is to make the most of the enforced breaks to disconnect. We have a huge four-week break in the middle of the summer. We have multiple two-week race breaks as well. And we had a couple of other big breaks last season as well. We may not have quite as many this season with an extra couple of races on the calendar. But I would say just make the most of the time away from the game when you can. I think it's really important to just have a moment to not stress and consume all this F1 fantasy content. I really like creating this. I, 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 get, I get such a kick out of it and engaging with you guys too. But I think as well, I'm very prone to not really taking a break. And I had two months, three months off over the winter break to just disconnect from making content, from engaging on Twitter. And I think that's been really good for me. I'm back with a renewed sense of enthusiasm for this and for the game. So I definitely think taking those breaks where you can is going to be very beneficial, not just for your decision-making, but also for your mental health because it is very easy to get worked up over a bad week scores and taking the time to just reset and be the best self you can be as ter in terms of a fantasy strategist is going to help you over the course of a very long season. And then the last thing is also just not letting others influence your decisions or at least influence them too much. I know I said just before that it is kind of ironic that I create content and I'm saying this, but I think as well, this game is meant to be fun and I'll get onto that in the last part of the video, but you don't want to consume it to a point where it's overwhelming you. And I think it's, it's meant to be a game. It's not meant to be life or death. And if you're getting to a point where you're not enjoying it because the outside influence is affecting your enjoyment of the game, then perhaps it's a, t a thing you need to consider about taking a step back and just making sure that you're enjoying it first and foremost. But there is a lot of content out there, so I appreciate it can be quite overwhelming. So maybe being selective with which content creators you want to look at and which content you want to consume, that will guide your decision making. Every strategist is very different in that sense. So let yourself make that decision and then from there hopefully it at least doesn't overwhelm you too much over a 24 race season and the last thing i would highly stress to any strategist that wants to play f1 fantasy is not to give up it is a long season i appreciate that we've got 24 races on the calendar this season 24 in 2024 but as I said, there's a lot of fantasy content out there. And I think because of the fact it is a long season, you do see attrition in this game over the course of the season. A lot of zombie teams kind of certainly regress by the second half of the season. But because of how much content there is out there, play the game your own way. If you want to be a more passive manager, you finish the race week, you forget about your team. Then as soon as we get close to the deadline, you want to jump onto the FanAmp live stream with Adam and I see what our decisions are, base your decisions on us. Sure, that's entirely up to you. I'm not going to tell you how to, how to play the game. But there's also so much content out there that over the course of the entire week, you might just want to guide your decisions based on what you're reading, what you're watching. But I think also given that 
there are so many zombie teams, so many people lose interest after the first kind of four to six weeks. You make more rank gains over the latter stages of the season when the chips are flowing more freely at those sprint race weekends. And realistically, it's it's evident to me that the more engaged strategists are the ones that finish in the top 5,000, the top 1,000, even the top 100. So if you are aiming to be a top fantasy strategist, you're going to have to persist for the whole season. But I think that goes back to making the most of those breaks, taking the time away so you can reset and then jumping right back into it with enthusiasm when the game or the next race starts to ramp up. But at the end of the day, as I've said, as I've continually stressed with this game, this is meant to be fun. I love playing F1 Fantasy. I love engaging with you guys. But if you find that the content you're consuming and the amount of time you're spending on the game is ruining your enjoyment, then maybe do take a few weeks to disconnect or a few days to disconnect. Delete Twitter, delete YouTube, whatever it might be. Everyone's got their own kind of approach to dealing with difficulties or challenges and i think mental health should always be number one so definitely take the time to distance yourself from the game so you can enjoy it not just for yourself but if you play with other people that's also a huge thing too so if you've got any questions around this video around other tips or strategies you use to tackle different mistakes or blunders you can make throughout the season, let me know down in the comments below. I've maybe missed a couple, maybe I haven't, but we'd love to hear from you guys. I'll be back with a few more videos closer to the start of the season, so do subscribe if you haven't already, but I appreciate you guys watching and I'll see you all very soon.